This episode is sponsored by Honey Badger. Are you looking to enhance clarity in production without a PhD in observability? Try Honey Badger Insights. Honey Badger Insights is built around structured events and Honey Badger's new query language Badger QL, which allows you to analyze data, create metrics, and design custom dashboards. All of this is available for free with Honey Badger's monitoring suite, which includes error tracking, uptime monitoring, and more. Explore your data in new ways with Badger QL. It's pretty cool and simple. So give it a try today at honeybadger.io. That's honeybadger.io. In this episode, we're going to have a look at Windows again. I've covered this in the past, but my process for setting up a development environment within Windows has changed a bit. And with WSL2, it is much easier to do. So in this episode, we're going to have a look at setting up a full development environment for Ruby on Rails within Windows 11. The system is moderately powerful with an AMD Ryzen 5900X and 32 gigabytes of RAM. It's not the newest machine, but it is still quite powerful. We're going to be using our native editor, which is Visual Studio Code, along with a native browser, but then our Ruby interpreter will live within the WSL. The first thing that we'll do is we'll run our terminal. I do have the terminal app, which you can get from the Microsoft Store if you don't already have it. Just do a search for Windows Terminal. It should pop up, making sure it's the one by Microsoft, and then you can install it. And I need to install WSL. So to do that, it's a lot easier now. You don't have to go through a bunch of different steps. I'll type in WSL, and I first want to see what's available. So I'll do a list online with two dashes in front of both of those. And then you can see that the default is Ubuntu. Then there's Debian and a few other options. So I'm going to go ahead and install WSL with a WSL dash dash install. And I want to pick my distribution, and I'm going to choose Debian. And this is just a personal preference, but I do prefer Debian over Ubuntu because it is a bit slower to take updates and I find it overall a bit more stable. And so this will give you a few different prompts and it may take a few minutes to install. Once that's done, I'm going to go ahead and reboot the computer. And it could take a few minutes to reboot. And then we have to enter in our credentials. So I'm going to give it a name. So I'll create a new user and then I'll give it a password and then we should be good. Now to access this, if we were to ever close it down, you can launch your terminal, and that's gonna take you into the command prompt, and then I'm gonna type Debian to then get into that shell. You're also given the option, if you just type in Debian, we had this Debian app, and I'm going to just pin it to my start and taskbar, so if I'm ever at my desktop, I can just click on the Debian logo, and then it takes me right in there. So one of the first things that I always want to do is to make sure I have all of the latest updates. So I'll run a sudo apt update ampersand ampersand to chain in multiple commands and a sudo apt upgrade. I'll pass the dash y so I don't have to answer any prompts. And then I'll type in the password and it's going to run the updates, which could take a few moments. But once that's done, we can then get started installing some additional packages. So I'm going to install the bare minimum that we're going to need for right now and that's with a sudo apt install. I'm going to install curl, git, and also zsh because I do prefer zsh for my primary shell. And I'll post a link to all these commands within the show notes so you can copy and paste from there. Next, I'm then going to install oh my zsh because I do like that shell wrapper. Running that sh command will make a curl request out to a GitHub project and it'll download and execute the install.sh. And I'll continue to change my default shell to zsh, entering in my password again, and then that's done. And then we can go ahead and proceed to install Ruby. However, before we do that, I want to get some kind of version manager. And personally, I do like using ASDF, and they provide a simple install script that you're able to run. So I'll go ahead and run that, which is going to get clone that directory. And then we need to run a few different things to get ASDF to boot up whenever we open up our terminal. So I'm going to run nano and from my home folder, 
I'm going to edit the zshrc file. And I don't like making any changes within this file, but instead, I just want to enter in one line. It's going to source, meaning that it's going to look at another file to execute whenever we open up our shell. We'll target our home folder, and then I'm just going to call it devrc. So any of my personal configurations, I'm going to put within the devrc file. I'll hit Control X. I'll then say that I want to save it with the Y and enter. And now we can edit our devrc file. And within the devrc, we need to paste in the command. That's going to make sure that ASDF is going to launch every time we open up our shell. And that's just with a dot in our home directory, ASDF, and the ASDF.sh. Because I am installing Ruby on here, I also want to enable YJIP by default. So I'm just going to set an export Ruby underscore YJIT underscore enable, and we'll set that equal to one. So we have this environment variable, Ruby YJIT enable with a value of one. I'll hit control X, Y, and then enter to save and close that. We can now source our ZSHRC file and it'll pick up those new settings. So now I can do an ASDF plugin add Ruby and it's going to install the Ruby plugin for ASDF. However, before we can install Ruby, there are some dependencies that we will need to install. Luckily, the Ruby plugin for ASDF does have some documentation on their GitHub repo on what packages you need to install. So I'll copy and paste that command within my terminal here, but it's just doing a sudo apt-get install and then a bunch of different packages that's going to be needed. So I'll go ahead and hit enter to execute those. And it again will take a few minutes to install all of those. And once that's done, we're ready to go ahead and install Ruby. So I'll do a ASDF install Ruby, and then I'll put in the version I want to install. And the latest is 3.3.0. This will take a few minutes to install. And depending on your hardware, it could take a bit longer. And just as a side note, while Ruby is installing in preparations for this episode, I did use a Windows laptop for a few weeks just to try it out to see if Windows is really a prime time development machine for Ruby on Rails development. And I really think it is. It's come a long ways. And unless if you have specific needs for Mac OS hardware, or if you have just really invested into that ecosystem, it's great to know that you're not limited to just a Mac OS computer. You are able to use an Apple computer a Linux one, or even Windows. We're not really limited anymore like we were several years ago. And I must say that overall, the experience wasn't bad developing on a Windows machine. I think my biggest hiccup, because I have such muscle memory for having used in Mac OS for so long, the biggest issue I came across was just having to remember that it's not Command C, but Control C to copy and likewise for pasting. So the keyboard shortcuts took a little bit to just kind of retrain myself to use from what I had been previously accustomed to. However, since I do have an Apple computer and I am invested in that ecosystem, I'll still continue to use those, but it's nice to know that I'm not limited to an Apple computer for Ruby on Rails development. And with Windows, if you didn't want to go the WSL route, there is always Docker, which I do have a few episodes on that as well. But using Windows and WSL, is also very feasible. So now that we have Ruby installed, I want to make it my global version that is going to run whenever I type Ruby and then some command. So I'll run ASDF global Ruby, and then I'll specify the version again. Now I can just type Ruby dash version and you'll see that it returns the Ruby 3.3.0 with YJIT enabled. One thing that I also do whenever I'm working with Ruby is I'll do a gem update dash dash system just to make sure I have the latest version of Ruby gems. And once that's done, I'm also going to echo a string into my gemrc file, and that is the gem colon dash dash no dash document, because I don't want to install the Ruby documentation on every gem I install. Then two greater signs, and I'll send this to my home folder, and then the dot gemrc file. We can then do stuff like gem install rails, and whatever else we want. And personally, I do like using ESBuild on my Rails applications, so I'm going to add another plugin. 
I'm going to do an ASDF plugin, add, and the Node.js. I can then do an ASDF install Node.js latest, and then an ASDF global Node.js latest. From here, I can go ahead and install yarn within npm d for global install yarn, and now I'm pretty much ready to go. So now that I have Rails installed and also yarn, I can create my Rails application. If I wanted to, I can echo in some more things like the dash dash JavaScript space ES build, and I can send this to my home directory and the Rails RC file so that any new Rails project I create will be JavaScript with ES build. And I can also do something similar with the CSS bootstrap. And also, if I wanted to use prop shaft by default, I can do in dash A and then prop shaft. So now we can go ahead and do a Rails new example to create our new example application. It'll go through, install all the gems that's needed. And once it's done, we're pretty much good to go. And so now we can list out our directories. We have our example application. We can CD into that example application folder and we can run bin dev. And of course, Foreman's not installed or found, so we could do a gem install Foreman and then run the bin dev again. And our application is now up and running. We can launch Edge, which I really find is very annoying, so I'm not even going to use Edge. Instead, I want to find something else. So I'm going to launch a new terminal, which takes me into PowerShell. And I want to install things like Visual Studio Code and also Google Chrome. I could use Edge to search for those and download them, but there's actually an easier option now. There is a program that's provided within Windows 11 called WinGet. I can do a search, passing in a query, and then in quotes, I can then do stuff like Google space Chrome in quotes, and then it's going to return a list of all the different things that I need. I do need to first agree to the source agreement terms, and you'll see that now we have an ID for Google Chrome. So to install it, I could do a winget install, and then I can paste in that google.chrome, and it's going to download and install Google Chrome for me. I don't have to launch Edge, navigate to Google Chrome's website, download it, and go through the install process. It does it all right from my terminal. And if there is anything that it does need permissions for, or any kind of setup wizard, it's going to run that automatically for us. But once it's installed, I can click on my home folder. I can type in Chrome. We see that it's installed and I'm going to pin it to my start and also my taskbar. So I have it available within my start menu or within my taskbar. And then I'll just switch back over to the Rails application. I can go to my local host port 3000 and you'll see that it's connected to my Rails application and it works. So that's pretty awesome that even though this is running within its own virtual environment on WSL, I do have access to it on my local host port 3000. So now to edit my application, I'm going to go back to my PowerShell and I want to do a win get. I'm going to search for the query and we'll do a search for Visual Studio Code. And I want to install the Visual Studio Code. I'll copy the ID, do a win get install. Microsoft.Visual Studio Code, and this is going to install Visual Studio Code for me. It again pops up the wizard for installing Visual Studio Code. It'll go through that process and then it'll be done. Again, I'll do a search for Visual Studio Code and I'll pin it to my start and to my taskbar, and I can launch that and it works. And if you're going to be following this along, one thing that's going to be very important to install is the WSL extension. It makes working within Windows, much easier. And if I have Visual Studio Code open, I can then just select our Remote Explorer, select the Debian distro, and then I'll connect to this Debian distro in my current window. It'll install VS Code within the WSL. And then I can open up a folder, and I want to open up my example folder, and then I'll trust the authors. And then I have access to my Rails application code. If I didn't have Visual Studio Code, open. And if I didn't have anything open except for my Debian shell, then you would think you can do a code dot and then it would launch Visual Studio, but it doesn't. What I have to do is first just exit that terminal. 
I'll then launch it again. I can then go into my example directory, and now I can type code dot, and it'll open up Visual Studio Code with that project automatically. So again, now I have my project open. I can hit the control tilde to bring up a terminal right there within the project, run bin dev, and you can see that it's automatically forwarding port 3000 to my local host, and I can refresh the page, and it works. And as the final thing to show, if you are going to be using PostgreSQL or MySQL, you will need to install a few different packages. So I'm going to do a sudo apt install. And for PostgreSQL, it is the lib pq dev. And for MySQL, it is the lib maria db dev. And if you install those, then you shouldn't have any issues installing the pg gem or the MySQL2 gem. I can test that out with a gem install pg, and that works. And I could do a gem install MySQL2 to test that out, and that works as well. So overall, it is a bit of a culture shock switching from macOS or Linux to Windows. But if you have a decent Windows machine, then it's very viable to do all of your development work straight within Windows and WSL. I do think that this is your best bang for the buck for a Windows machine versus a comparable Mac Studio or Mac Mini or laptop. And I'm really interested to see what's going to happen in the coming months with the Qualcomm Snapdragon XLE processor that's coming out for Windows on ARM machines. Well, that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching.